Hi, I'm Toby and welcome to another episode of The Joys of Mathematics. If you're new here to this series, just know it's a little bit different to the previous few videos on my channel. Today we are not working through exam questions and we're not trying to gain anxiety by proving ourselves and testing ourselves with mathematics. Instead, we're using maths to try and find some enjoyment, to have some fun exploring some of the ideas and using our imaginations. So I'm going to work through some ideas today related to calculus. Uh, that'll, that'll be implicit differentiation and related rates of change. But don't worry if you don't know what that means. I'm here to work through it with you. I think we'll go at a reasonably relaxed pace, so hopefully you find some enjoyment from just sitting back and watching along. Today we're in a happy little forest with some happy little trees. There's some snow in the forest and this is a bit of a contrast to the warm Australian weather around me. So in our forest we have a few tall trees. Now this one here curiously was planted during our snowstorm. So we have a few concerns about whether the roots of this tree are actually, you know, deep enough into the ground to get some traction and to hold this tree up nice and sturdy. So let's draw in here where I know the hard ground underneath is. Draw it in white. So this is the, where the solid ground starts beneath the snow. And the roots of the tree come down from here and they wriggle around in the snow and they try to find that solid ground to you know, really hold this tree up nice and sturdy. I'm going to enlarge what I've just drawn there up in the corner. So the biggest and most obvious root from the tree is one that comes down and then back up again. Now if I draw this line here to represent the solid ground that the root needs to reach, then this is our situation. You might notice that this shape here is actually a parabola and it can be modelled with a quadratic equation. This will be the form of it. ax squared plus bx plus c, where our a, b and c are our coefficients x is what we would like to solve for to find where this root intercepts the flat line. It's root, the roots of the equation um, is exactly where it intercepts and that's the solution to this. If you were to set f of x equal to zero, complete the square on this. Now I'm not going to work through the algebra but I'm going to write down the solution that you would get. It would be that the roots can be found at minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now if you've done a bit of maths or physics this is probably a very familiar friend to you, our quadratic formula. Um, you might notice that I draw my x's like two lovers kissing. Some of you had a problem with that in previous comment sections. Just know that I do that to make it very clear that it's different from how I would write an x if I was writing down the letter x or if I was using an x to represent multiplication instead of like using a dot or something. My little curly x here means it's definitely a variable. Now with our little quadratic here, I know that the equation for him is f of x is equal to x squared minus 3x plus 4. That means that our a is 1, our b is minus 3, and our c is 4. Now there's something else you need to know about our quadratic formula here, and that's that this interesting stuff under the square root, our b squared minus 4ac, is called the determinant. The reason it's called that is because it determines basically the behavior of our solution. So if everything here under the square root was equal to zero, that wouldn't be part of it. And we would just have minus b over 2a. We would have one solution for x and one place where our root comes into contact with the ground. If the b squared minus 4ac was positive, then we'd have the square root of a positive number being added or subtracted from b. 
uh, and we would end up with two values of x, so we'd have two roots. In that case, what we would have is our ground and two points of intercept. The other possibility is that this determinant is less than zero or negative, and in that case we're taking the square root of a negative number and that's going to bring over our imaginary friends. If our imaginary friends are involved, then there are not going to be any real roots. Okay, and this is the situation we would see. There are no real places where the root intercepts the ground. So what do we have in our case? This is our quadratic here. So our determinant is going to be minus three squared, that's nine, minus four times one times four, that's nine minus 16. That's going to be equal to minus seven, meaning that this is negative. We're not going to have any real roots. This is going to be our situation. And it's very unfortunate for the tree indeed, because there are no places where its strongest root makes contact with the solid ground. That's going to mean our tree is going to fall over. So let's rub some of this off to make room for our falling tree. Take our tree as well. And let's draw him back at a bit of an angle. Now this will say is our trunk. I guess it was a bit of a strange decision for anybody to be planting trees during a snowstorm, but I guess this is what happens. You know, people have made worse decisions in human history. This one isn't too bad, but it's pretty bad for this sort of tree friend of ours. Now we want to make him look pretty with his leaves and everything. Just because he's falling over doesn't mean he needs to look ugly. That's our tree in there. Now, while this tree falling process was going on, uh, all the drama, the uh, time changed a bit and the moon moved through the night sky to the point where it was directly above our tree. We're drawing our little moon dust here. So there are a few things that I know about this tree. One of them is that when it was standing up straight, its height was five meters. Now that's not ever going to change. It is still five meters tall. Now somebody looked at this tree and made some measurements while it was falling. They made their measurement when the tree was three meters off the ground. We're actually gonna to need to draw back our ground. We don't wanna appear to be falling off a cliff. When the tree was three meters off the ground, the top of the tree was falling down through the sky at a rate of one meter per second. I've written that as minus one because it's moving downwards. Now this axis here, the height, I'm going to be referring to as the Y axis. So just know that that's the one I'm talking about. Likewise, this one down here is going to be the X axis. Okay, so when the tree is falling, since the moon is directly overhead, it is going to be casting a shadow down onto the X axis. We're going to have the shadow of a tree down in here. What we want to know is as it's falling, at the moment when it was you know, measured to be three meters and to have this rate of falling, what is the rate the shadow is going to be growing along the floor? Now we can quite easily work that out using calculus, but before we do any calculus, we're just going to do a bit of Pythagoras. Now, first of all, there is something called a Pythagorean triple, and it means that if we know that two sides of a triangle are five and three, that the other side is going to be of length four. This comes from the rule that this side squared plus this side squared will equal this side squared. Three squared plus four squared should equal five squared. Um, so I'm able to write down four as the length of this bottom side. Using that same Pythagoras equation I just spoke about, I'll write it down for a general case. X squared plus Y squared 
is going to be equal to 5 squared. Our hypotenuse length here is always going to be 5, so that's constant. But our x and our y will change as it falls. Now what we want to know, like I said, is the rate that this shadow is growing. That can be represented as the change in x over time, dx dt. And what I've written down here as the rate that the top of the tree moves downwards, that is actually dy dt. I hope you can see that up there. This is calculus notation. So how are we going to get dx dt? Well, we don't really know very much, but we have this formula here that can help us. And we've got a few little useful bits of information lying around. Now I'll just move this out of the way. And what I'm going to do is first beat the devil out of this eraser a little bit. Um, yep, that's a bit better. We're going to differentiate this entire equation here with respect to time. Now this is going to be implicit differentiation because we don't have some nice little thing that says like x equals this and we can differentiate that thing explicitly. Uh, everything's, we've got two variables that you know, might independently depend on time. So just watch how we're going to do this. We're going to differentiate it term by term. Using the power rule on the first term, we're going to have 2x. And then that's going to be times by dx dt. We need to times it by that because we're treating this like the chain rule. The outside function that we're doing is to differentiate x squared. And then we need to times it by the derivative of the inside function, which is x. And it might have you know, a dependence on t. That's our first term. Likewise, for the second term, we're going to have 2y times um, dy dt. I'm running out of room here, but that is all going to be equal to 0 because the derivative of the constant here is going to be 0. Now, let's have a look at this. At the moment in time where we made our measurement of the rate of falling, that was at y equals 3. Correspondingly, x was equal to 4 and dy dt was equal to minus 1. Let's just put all of those constants into our equation and see what we get. We get 2 times 4 times dx dt plus 2 times 3 times minus 1 equals 0. Okay? Uh, we can solve this, we can cancel the 2's. We can take minus 3, we can add that to the other side, and we can divide by 4, meaning that what we would be left with, I'll find some room up here, is we would get dx dt equal to 3 over and that there is actually what we wanted. If you want to put a unit on it, it's meters per second. But that is the rate of growth of the shadow along the floor. I hope that's been a nice little glance at implicit differentiation and using a little bit of basic calculus to find your way through a problem. Now I will say that this problem here about the falling tree in the shadow was actually taken from an MIT calculus exam. I think it was the most basic cal calculus exam that they have at MIT, but nonetheless it was taken from a uni exam. Calculus obviously gets a lot more advanced than this at uni, but these are where you need to start if you're going to be on that journey of becoming great at calculus. In my little series here, I believe that any of the math that I'm doing is not inherently difficult and can be done by any of you at home. I think math uh, comes down to what you've been able to practice, what you've been able to try out for yourself, the kind of conversations you've had and the learning environment that you've been involved with. So keep going if you are trying to learn math for yourselves. This episode of The Joy of Mathematics is sponsored by Brilliant.org. So you can go to brilliant.org slash tibbies and sign up for free. If you would like to have a look at some more um, playful maths, try out some more imaginative and exciting math 
problems. Um, the first 200 of you that use that link to sign up can get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you very much for, to Brilliant for helping me to continue to make videos and I'd recommend it as a source for people wanting to further learn some of these math skills. Thank you for watching this episode and I hope you have an absolutely mathematical day.